Georg Ebers was an Egyptologist at Leipzig University. He's perhaps better known in his time as a novelist because he tried to popularize Egyptology by writing period romances. In 1873 he was in the city of Luxor, Egypt, looking for something in particular because there had been a rumor in the Egyptology community that someone had discovered a particularly important document. He found the document and purchased it at an antiquity shop. What he purchased was a papyrus scroll, some 63 feet long, that has since become known as the Ebers Papyrus and is thought to have been written around 1500 BC and to be actually copies of works that were even older than that. It is among the most important of the Egyptian medical texts. It gives us an insight into the practice of medicine in ancient Egypt. Among the many interesting parts of the Ebers Papyrus is a prescription for the elimination of urine that is too plentiful, which is thought to be the earliest known record of the identification of the disease that today we know as diabetes. It affects some 450 million people worldwide. And while the disease was recognized in antiquity, the Ebers Papyrus suggests treating it with a concoction that included elderberry, milk, and beer swill, the most important discovery in the treatment of diabetes occurred in the 1920s. November is Diabetes Awareness Month in the United States when communities work together to raise awareness of a disease among its victims include my father. The discovery of the miracle drug insulin is history that deserves to be remembered. The Egyptians were not the only ancient culture to recognize the disease. Hindu physicians recognized the difference between type 1 and type 2 diabetes as early as 500 BC. Chinese medical texts described the disease as early as the 5th century BC. Ancient Greek texts attribute the name of the disease to the 1st century BC physiologist Demetrius of Apamea. Although no original works of Demetrius survive, his work is mentioned in later Greek works. The Greeks saw diabetes as a condition of the kidneys, described as the inability to retain fluid. As any fluid drunk was assumed to pass through as if through a pipe, diabetes is the ancient Greek word that means to pass through. Ancient physicians seem to have little response to the condition. The first century AD Greek physician Eritreus of Cappadocia described the condition as the melting down of flesh and limbs into urine and warned that if the constitution of the disease be completely established, for the melting is rapid, the death speedy, and added, moreover, life with the disease is disgusting and painful. Eritreus gave us his prescription eating cereals and drinking milk and wine. The prescription is strikingly similar to that in the Ebers Papyrus, written 1600 years previous. The understanding of diabetes developed slowly. The 17th century English anatomist Thomas Willis rediscovered the idea that diabetes was associated with sugar in the urine, a fact described by Hindu and Chinese physicians 2000 years before. While realizing its connection to urination, he called the disease the pissing evil, Willis, whom some credit with the adding of the name mellitus, derived from the Latin word for sweet, to describe diabetes, also recognized that rather than an illness of the kidney, diabetes was related to blood. He recognized a connection to diet and prescribed a thickening and moderately cooling diet and cordials. In the 19th century, several researchers realized that there were abnormalities in the pancreases of people who had died of diabetes, but the role that the pancreas played in the disease was still not clear. In 1868, German medical student Paul Langerhans identified two systems in the pancreas. One set of cells produced the pancreatic enzymes used in digestion. He was unable, however, to determine the function of the other set of cells. In 1889, German physiologists Oskar Minkowski and Joseph von Mehring established the connection more clearly. They performed a pancreatectomy on a dog and noted that it developed symptoms of diabetes, including a high sugar content in its urine. The two were thus able to determine that the unknown cells produce a substance related to the regulation of blood sugar. Because the cells looked like small clumps which floated like islands, they were called islets of Langerhans. Later, the Latin word for island insula would give the purified version of those cells its name, insulin. While the relationship between pancreatic cells and diabetes was becoming understood, the method of isolating and purifying the substance as a treatment had not been developed. Several researchers made attempts to isolate the islet's secretions. 
In 1906, German physician George Zolzer achieved some success using pancreatic extracts on diabetic dogs. He also had partial success with a patient in a diabetic coma using an extract from cow pancreas that was manufactured by a small company in Berlin. The patient showed some improvement but developed side effects and the supply of the extract ran out. He was unable to produce a breakthrough and his laboratory was turned over to the German military during World War I. Professor Israel Kleiner of New York's Rockefeller University had some success reducing symptoms using pancreatic extracts in 1915. But World War I interrupted his work, and he did not return to it. It seems that the potential breakthrough was interrupted by the war, and the eventual solution came from a surgeon of that war. Frederick Banting had his medical training rushed to serve the Great War with the Canadian Army Medical Corps. Wounded by shrapnel, he returned to London, Ontario, Canada, and opened a practice. But his practice struggled, so he also took on work as a demonstrator at the medical school at the University of Western Ontario. He was assigned to do a lecture on the function of the pancreas, and in October 1920, in the course of researching for his lecture, saw an article in the Journal of Surgery, Gynecology, and Obstetrics by a University of Minnesota pathologist named Moses Barron. The article was entitled, The Relation of Islets of Langerhans to Diabetes, with special reference to cases with pancreatic lithiosis. Lithiosis means, essentially, stony concretions in the body, like gallstones or kidney stones. In this case, the article talked about stones in the pancreas. The author talked about a patient where a stone in the pancreas blocked the duct that produced digestive enzymes. In the case, the pancreas atrophied except for the islet cells. It occurred to Banting that he could simulate the same condition in dogs. He jotted down a note. Ligate pancreatic ducts of the dog. Keep dogs alive till acini degenerate, leaving islets. Try to isolate internal secretion of these and relieve glycosuria. His idea was to surgically tie off the same part of the dog's pancreas that had been blocked in Brown's patient, and then identify and purify the islets of Langerhans. In brief, he had a plan to isolate insulin. But Banting was a local physician, not a research physician. He didn't have a lab. He didn't have publishing experience. He didn't really have the means to test his hypothesis. A colleague suggested that he talk to Dr. John McLeod, who was a lecturer the University of Toronto. Banting presented his idea to McLeod in the spring of 1921. Unlike Banting, McLeod was an experienced research physician. McLeod was born in Scotland and in 1898 had gotten a PhD in medicine from the University of Aberdeen. He had been a lecturer in biochemistry at the London Hospital Medical School and earned a doctorate in public health from Cambridge University. In 1903, he immigrated to the United States and taught at Western Reserve University in Cleveland, Ohio for 15 years. After the war, he was employed at the University of Toronto as director of the physiology lab and faculty in the course of medicine. He had studied a number of important topics, among them carbohydrate metabolism and diabetes, a subject upon which he had published several papers. It seemed a good fit. McLeod shared an interest in the study of diabetes and had access to lab space. But in many ways, it was not a good fit. McLeod was unimpressed with Banting, essentially a country physician, and didn't think he had a good understanding of diabetes. He was also not impressed with Banting's plan. McLeod was aware of the works of physicians like George Zolzer, who had only found limited success treating diabetes with pancreatic extracts. He thought it more likely that blood sugar was regulated somehow by the nervous system. Still, Banting was passionate and convinced McLeod to give him laboratory space to test his idea during a summer while McLeod was going to be vacationing in Scotland. While he was not convinced by the idea, McLeod assigned the young physician an assistant, Charles Bast, who worked as a demonstrator at the school. McLeod also provided lab animals and gave advice on project planning and analytical techniques. The research over the summer was difficult, largely because the subjects, dogs that had either had their pancreas removed or the ducks ligated, really lived long enough to experiment upon. But while McLeod was in Scotland, Banting and Best managed a breakthrough. Using the method of ligation, they had managed to isolate the pancreatic secretion of one dog and use that secretion to treat glycosuria in another animal that had had its pancreas removed. The results were actually stunning. The extract reduced the blood sugar of the dog with induced diabetes by 40% in one hour. But upon return, McLeod was unconvinced, pointing out flaws in the method of study. He suggested the experiments be repeated with more dogs and better equipment. While he moved Banting and Bast into a better laboratory and began paying Banting a salary from his research grants, 
Banting took the criticisms as an attack on his integrity and apparently started to worry that McLeod was trying to take credit for his work. The tension grew more when they presented their findings at the Conference of the American Physiological Society at Yale University on December 30th. Banting was nervous and inexperienced and did a poor job presenting the findings. When McLeod stepped in to rescue the presentation, Banting took it as more evidence that McLeod was trying to steal credit for his work. By then they had addressed the biggest difficulty, the bottleneck that came from the time-consuming task of duct-tying dogs and waiting weeks to be able to extract insulin, and were extracting insulin from cattle. The work was so promising that McLeod shut down all of the work at the lab to focus on the production of insulin. In January, they made the first trial on a human, 14-year-old Leonard Thompson. Thompson was dying of type 1 diabetes, an affliction that affects children where they are unable to produce insulin. At the time, a diagnosis of this type of diabetes was a death sentence. But there was a problem. The insulin was impure and caused an allergic reaction. McLeod brought in another researcher, biochemist James Collip, to help purify the insulin. A lecturer in the Department of Physiology at the University of Alberta, Collip was at the University of Toronto on a traveling scholarship. An expert on blood chemistry, Collip developed a method of purifying insulin using alcohol. By then, the tension between Banting and McLeod was acute, and Collip only shared his discovery with McLeod. The drama aside, the team had finally developed a successful process for producing usable insulin. Banting, Best, and Collip shared the patent, which they sold to the University of Toronto for one dollar. It is difficult to overstate the significance of this discovery. It changed not just the treatment, but the prognosis for the millions of people suffering from diabetes. The results were so significant that people literally rose up from comas. Press at the time described the results as miraculous. One of the many millions who benefited from this new treatment was Leonard Thompson, who received his second dose of insulin about 12 weeks after the first dose, which was impure, had caused allergic reactions. At the time, his prognosis was death within weeks, but because of insulin, he went on to live another 13 years, passing away in 1935 of pneumonia at the age of 27. Banting and McLeod shared the Nobel Prize for Medicine in 1923, but the prize only increased the tension between the two. Banting believed that McLeod had not contributed enough to be included in the Nobel Prize and felt that Charles Best had been slighted, decided that he would share his part of the prize with Charles Best, and McLeod, as a response, decided to share his part of the prize with James Collip. Banting spent the rest of his life arguing that McLeod had contributed little to the discovery, but later analyses are kinder to McLeod, suggested he had a larger role than Banting claimed, and said that his management of the trials, his interpretation of the data, and his publication of the results were significant enough to include him on the Nobel Prize award. But one of the results of this conflict between Banting and McLeod is that the contributions of Charles Best and James Collip are kind of lost in the noise. In 1972, the Nobel Foundation agreed that they had erred in not including Charles Best in the Nobel Prize Award. There was a further controversy in that many other researchers had come close to the discovery of insulin. Notable among those was Romanian physiologist Nicolae Polescu, who had been using pancreatic extract to treat diabetes in dogs prior to the Toronto team. However, he was never able to successfully purify his formula. It is certainly fair to say that the work of the Toronto team built upon the work of many other scientists, many of whom came very close to making the discovery themselves. There is a further controversy in that much of the work regarding the identification and purification of insulin involved surgery on living animals. The practice called vivisection is still controversial today. There are many different memorials, buildings, streets, awards named after Banting, McLeod, Best, and Collip. Among them is the Flame of Hope in London, Ontario, which was kindled by the Queen Mother in 1989. It stands not just as a memorial to Frederick Banting, but also as a reminder that insulin is a treatment, but not a cure for diabetes. And the flame is only to be extinguished when an actual cure is found. I hope you enjoyed this episode of the History Guy, short snippets of forgotten history between 10 and 15 minutes long. And if you did enjoy, please go ahead and click that thumbs up button. 
If you have any questions or comments or suggestions for future episodes, please write those in the comment section. I will be happy to personally respond. Be sure to follow The History Guy on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and check out our merchandise on teespring.com. And if you'd like more episodes on Forgotten History, all you need to do is subscribe. <laughs>